Hello and welcome to this presentation called Sebastian Bach Unwrapping the Gift. My name is Jeff Fox. I am the Director of Sacred Arts at First Presbyterian Church of Bonita Springs, Florida, and it's my pleasure to take this little journey with you. This 35-minute video will take us on a little bit of a tour of Bach, his theology, and a little of his music, and I hope that you enjoy this way of looking at Bach and coming maybe to a better understanding of his music and his thought process. You see the title, Sebastian Bach, why not call him Johann? What a lot of people don't know is that Bach's father was named Johann. Uh, Bach had five brothers, all named Johann, and they obviously did not use Johann when they referred to each other. They all used their middle names. So Sebastian was known as Sebastian to his family members, his brothers, his father, and so on. So a little bit of trivia just to get you started. The music of Bach is rich in symbolism and meaning. Not just because it's beautiful music, but because everything he wrote, he wrote as an offering to God. It just wasn't enough for Bach to write a beautiful melody or an intense fugue. When he wrote, he filled his music with ideas and musical gestures to the point that nearly every note has meaning or is delivering a message about his faith in God. Analyzing Bach in this way, it's a difficult task for even the most seasoned and well-educated musician. But it's something we're gonna try to do with this presentation. But first, let me illustrate what I'm trying to say about Bach's compositional skill by showing you an illustration he drew. This is the Bach monogram. It's a drawing he created himself and he used it to identify much of his music. Every single stroke in this monogram has meaning. So let's take a look. It's an interesting illustration, and by looking at it, it's very pleasant, welcoming, the crown hints at a regal idea. But like Bach's music, full of symbolism and meaning, we need to understand what he's trying to tell us. So to do that, we're going to take this monogram apart. Look carefully at the highlighted portion of his monogram. It's created by using his initials, J, S, B. Here you can see that the rest of the main body is created by his initials in the mirror image. This was a technique he used in his music as well. So the entire main body of this monogram is simply his initials, both forward and the mirror image. There's so much more to discover because this is really just the first layer of meaning in this monogram. When Bach first created this symbol, he wrote this Latin phrase to describe it. Symbolum Christus coronabit crucigeros, which means symbol, Christ will crown those who carry his cross. So you can see on this image that the two S strokes from his initials, both forward and in reverse, combine to form the Greek letter X, or the Christus. That's a symbol representing Christ. Now we know Bach used this because he would use the Christus, or the Chi symbol, in his handwritten scores rather than write out the word Christ. Here you can see that the Christus symbol is represented two more times, a trinity. So you can clearly see that the initials JSB carry the cross of Christ. Not only that, but if you look carefully, you can see that there appear to be thorns coming out of the strokes used to create these initials that create these three crosses. So now his motto or the saying Christ will crown those who carry his cross makes more sense. So here you see over the symbol he's created using his three initials, he's also placed obviously a crown. Notice that the crown contains 12 jewels. You can see seven jewels at the points 
at the top of the crown. The other five are at the band going across. There are five jewels, rectangular jewels, that go across the band of this crown. Twelve represents the number of disciples, and seven jewels at the top are the biblical number of completion. Creation was completed in seven days, for example. The other five jewels represent the five wounds of Christ on the cross, two hands, two feet, and the pierced side. So here it is again, Bach's monogram. So rich in meaning, it tells you so much about Bach and about his theology and his love for God. But if you don't take the time to pull it apart and really understand how it was constructed, then it just looks like an interesting drawing. You'd have missed the meaning. And I think this is so true of Bach's music. He constructed his music with this same kind of symbolism and care. It's like a gift that has to be unwrapped to be fully appreciated and understood. You could guess what's inside. A beautifully wrapped gift is just that. It's something that looks beautiful on the outside but holds so much promise on the inside. This monogram had to be unwrapped for us to fully appreciate it. Well, now we get to take a look at a piece of box music and we're gonna unwrap the gift in the same way and see what we can discover about Bach and his love for God. We're going to use Bach's Mass in F. It's a lesser known work and it was written so that it could be used in both Lutheran services and in Catholic services. The opening movement is of any mass is the Kyrie and on the screen you see the Greek words Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, and Kyrie eleison, and their English translation on the right. So let's take a few minutes and just listen to the piece, enjoy the music, note the things that you will notice on the first hearing of a piece, but it will be a little like our first look at the Bach monogram. You'll find it interesting, it's a beautiful piece, but there's more to unwrap. Let's listen.
It's a beautiful piece. Take time when you can to listen to the entire Mass. But for now, you see on the screen the first page of the vocal score. You'll notice that it's a fugue, and it's written in four voice parts, but the fugue is only in three parts, the soprano, the alto, and the tenor. Again, highlighting the idea of the trinity. The bass part, which begins at the bottom of the bottom system, sings just a very basic melody at a slower pace. Okay, it's time to dig in. This is gonna be fun, I promise. Now you can see the main theme of the Kyrie is highlighted here. Let's just listen to that played on the piano. So keep that theme in mind as we move along here. That's the Kyrie theme. You'll remember this is a three-part structure, so next comes the Christe theme, Christ have mercy. Let's take a closer look at that. Here you can see the Christe theme. It starts in the alto and it's highlighted here. Let's take a listen to this theme on the piano. Bach does something fascinating with this theme, and I think it makes a theological point. But first, let's go back and take a listen just to the opening of this uh, in the recording of this Christe section, just to remind ourselves and get it back in our ear. Let's compare the Kyrie theme with the Christe theme. So here is the Christe theme and the Kyrie theme, uh, one on top of the other. Let's listen to them individually. First, the Kyrie. Then the Christe. Just for fun, let's listen to them together, although they're not really intended to be played together like this. But here they go. Now, as you look at this visually, do you notice anything? They're, in fact, mirror images of each other. Where the Kyrie goes up, the Christe goes down. Where the Kyrie goes down, the Christe goes up. They are mirror images of each other. So the question is, why would Bach do that? To find the answer to that question, we're going to take a little look at the Nicene Creed, is something you are likely familiar with. What you see on the screen is the portion of the Creed that tells us who Christ is. It says that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of the God, Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. The Nicene Creed as a whole emphasizes the oneness of God the Father and God the Son and the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son are not two separate beings, but they are one in the same. This was an important theological point that was be, has been debated um, really throughout Christianity, but especially during the Reformation. So musically, God the Father, God the Son, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, Bach illustrates this oneness, this one comes from the other by creating a mirror image. Christ is the mirror image of God. He is the same. They are not two separate entities. An important theological point, a difficult theological point, and one that he makes so beautifully by putting these two themes together. Here you see part three of the Kyrie. We return to the Kyrie text, and Bach does something even more interesting here. The soprano starts by singing the opening theme from the Kyrie portion, the part that represents the father. Two measures later, the tenors sing the Christe theme, 
but to the text of Curie, the mirror image. So in this movement, he's putting these two themes together at the same time. And so the question, of course, is why? Well, there's been a lot of trinity represented in this piece, the three-voice fugue, the three-section Curie Christe Curie, the first section if it represents the father, and the second section represents the son, then we know that this third section somehow must represent the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to the Nicene Creed to see if we can understand what Bach did here. This is the portion of the Nicene Creed dealing with the Holy Spirit, which says we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. So I think Bach continues to tackle this difficult idea of the Trinity by using the two images, the Curie Father image and the mirror image Christ, to represent what we just read in the Nicene Creed, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. This is his way of representing that third member of the Trinity musically. It's a great illustration of a very difficult the theological concept. These three distinct movement sections of this Curie all emanate from one theme, yet they all relate to each other in this wonderfully unified way. I mentioned earlier that the music of Bach is constructed in many layers of musical construction as well as meaning. So we're going to look at another layer of this piece to see what we can find. So you can see these two themes on the screen. Let's uh, first remind ourselves of what the text, the words mean. Kyrie means Lord, uh, Christe means Christ, and eleison means mercy. So let's focus on the word mercy. The three final notes of mercy are what we're gonna focus on. Remember how God extended his mercy for us by giving us Christ to die on the cross. Well, I can show you now that the concept of mercy is also represented here in this music. With the two themes superimposed, you can see that the last three notes cross each other. They form that Greek chi or Christus symbol. The concept for, of mercy is represented here through the cross. The cross is the source of mercy that the choir is singing about when they sing the word eleison. This idea was not unique to this piece. This is something Bach did over and over in his music in order to represent the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. If that weren't enough, I'm gonna give you one more layer of construction to think about. And you have to be wondering, where has my little dog gone? How is that song going to help? Well, it will. What I want you to do is listen to this recording, this version of where, oh, where has my little dog gone? It's very simple. It's just a piano playing the melody and a bass line. Listen and see if you can hear the answer to the question, where has my little dog gone? Did you hear it? It's okay if you didn't. We're going to listen to this again, but I'm going to flip the parts. I'm going to put the bass line up on top, played by the flute, and the melody, Oh Where Oh Where Has My Little Dog Gone, will be in the bass part. And I think this time you might hear the answer to the question. Let's see. Bet you heard it this time. That's right, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I played both melodies together, one to answer the question of the first. Where did my little dog go? Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Now, what's the point of this? The point of this is that Bach did the same thing, not just in this piece, but in much of his music. There's another melody that's a part of the piece that helps us understand the meaning of the piece. Let's take a look. 
we're going to listen again to the opening portion of this, the opening QDA. And I want you to listen carefully for something maybe you missed on your first hearing. This time, you're going to listen carefully for a trumpet that enters right after the sopranos begin their version of the theme. The trumpet is going to be in very long pitches playing the melody that you see on the screen now in three parts uh, throughout the opening section of this Kyrie. Listen carefully. It can be easy to miss. Uh, let's take a listen and see what we hear. I hope you were able to hear that trumpet melody spread throughout that section of the piece. That melody is actually a German chorale tune, whose title is Christe du Lam Gottes, very well known by Germans in Bach's day. They would have recognized it when they heard it, very much like you recognized Somewhere Over the Rainbow. The text for it is here, Christe du Lam Gottes, and the translation is, Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Now, does that sound familiar? It really is very much the same structure as the text of the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. You take away the sins of the world. Christ, have mercy. The final phrase, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. So again, an, a melody in three sections, the Trinitarian idea is enhanced yet one more time. And what Bach has done for members of his congregation is he's given them their translation. He's given them the language of the people, which is something that we do in the Reformed tradition. It's very important for us to know what it is we're singing. And in this case, Bach goes back to the traditional Greek uh, text, but for his German audience, he provides a built-in translation by adding this melody. It's not quite sung. The basses kind of hint at this melody. Uh, they were never part of the fugue, but the trumpet really spells it out. In all three sections, the trumpet plays this melody. So it's like a three-verse hymn in a way, or a three-verse chorale prelude in a sense. So did the people who heard this music catch everything that Bach built into his, his piece? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. His congregation certainly heard the familiar tune. They understood the idea of providing a translation for them. They were even likely to be aware of the Trinity structures that were built into the music. Perhaps his singers were told the significance of the inverted fugue theme and what they represented to Bach and that illustration of the Trinity. But the fact is that this gift was not wrapped for his congregation. It was a gift wrapped for God. As I'm sure you know, Bach finished off all of his works with the inscription, Soli Deo Gloria, only for God's glory. God, of course, is very aware of all of the genius and the talent and the love that went into the creation of this gift. We have the privilege of being able to unwrap the gift now and what it tells us is the kind of faith that Bach had, the kind of devotion that went into his music, and what kind of genius he was as a composer. It's a great thrill to be able to come back to this music, look at it in such a deep way, and unwrap the gift. And I hope that you do that with other pieces that he's written, or that you look deeply into the music of other composers as you're working on them, as you're singing them, as you're teaching them. 
What I'd like you to do now is take the opportunity to listen to this piece all the way through one more time, having a deeper knowledge and a deeper understanding of what Bach did, and really appreciate every little nuance as you're listening and as you're unwrapping this beautiful gift. Thanks for your attention. Yeah.